So the web journal State of Mind is in New York to have an interview with the current director of the Albert Heinrich Institute of New York, Dr. Christine Doyle, and with the, the director of the professional uh, education, education uh, in the Albert Heinrich Institute, and also professor of psychiatry in St. George University in New York. The RIBT is very identified with the, the strong personality <laughs> of Albert Ellis. But I want to ask to both of you how is developing RIBT after that Albert died? Well, I think that um, we who have trained under Dr. Ellis have made it a point to carry out his mission which is to train as many mental health professionals in REBT as possible so that they can go out and train professionals and treat, treat people with this method. Um, what we have done since Dr. Ellis's um, death, which was in 2007, um, is we have really taken a closer look at the theory. And we are currently testing the theory to determine whether or not um, the root of emotional disturbance is from demanding this, or if the irrational beliefs and the derivatives, are, if they're independent of one another. Um, because up until this point, we have not really looked at that. We've had assumptions about what it is, but we don't really have the data. So we've really um, taken that as a priority to, to test out. We've also done a major research study on REBT for the treatment of depression, which was very successful. And we're running a major study, an outcome study on REBT and other cognitive therapies on generalized anxiety disorder. So we're trying to do more scientific research. Oh, yes. In fact, the original 11 uh, irrational beliefs of Albert was about more or less a lot of disorders. Right. Are you now attempting to classify more specific, uh, I think, uh, models, RBT models for each disorder. I think that one of the things we're trying to do is develop small, irrational, rational belief scales for each problem. One for parents who get angry at their children, one for people that have eating disorders. Uh -huh. And so we're probably going to put up on our web page a number of you know, 20 or 30 different smaller 10 item irrational belief scales that are very related to one specific problem. We're also trying to do some research on the same scales in different countries and across countries to see the cross cultural relevance. And one of the studies we found that, let's say, with anxiety, in one country, one irrational belief seemed to be most related, but in another country, it was different. So it may be that in different countries with different cultures, more some irrational beliefs are more important than others, depending on the country. Well, this helps me to introduce the next question. That what about this global development for uh, the REBT? We we have actually quite a global presence. Um, at REBT, we have affiliated training centers all around the world: um, South America, Australia, Europe. And um, these are the individuals that come here for training and then develop their own centers. Um, and REBT and CBT is becoming much more popular. I actually, this week, did a poll of our different centers to find out in their particular country what the most predominant psychotherapy orientation is. And um, REBT is becoming much more predominant in many of the, in many of the countries where we've trained those professionals. Psychoanalysis is still, unfortunately, in my, <laughs> my opinion, um, popular in places like France and South America, but um, there's definitely a push to, to spread RMBT. And when we do training in New York, 50% uh, or more of the people who come are from outside the United States. So in the training, we may have people from India, Italy, South America, Argentina, Peru, Australia, India, Pakistan, Singapore. So it's become much more of an international global theory 
and the contributions are coming from all over the world. I think this really strengthens the literature mm -hmm. and the support for REBT. And what about the, the bridge on walls, similar, similarities and differences between REBT and the other form, forms of uh, cognitive therapy? Okay, I think that most cognitive behavior therapies have a few things in common. They're all pretty active and directive. They all identify some type of conscious current beliefs that cause emotional problems. They all try to change those cognitions, and they all include some kind of behavioral homework assignment. I think the thing that differs is what type of thoughts and cognitions that they think are important. Some think the importance is the prediction of negative events, or the, what we might call negative automatic thoughts. And in REBT, we would spend less time challenging the truth of a negative perception of reality or a negative prediction of reality, but rather deal with the more evaluative thoughts about whether or not that negative reality should be, is it really awful, can one stand it? So I think that we would go for more schematic, implicit thoughts about what should be and how things are evaluated rather than what is. I think REBT may be closer to the more schematic cognitive therapies in that mm -hmm. regard. And I think we share a lot in the you know, metacognitive therapies. We want to teach people to identify how they think, identify their thinking errors, and be able to do the therapy on their own. So it's a coping skill that when they confront a activating event, they know the steps, and they know what type, what are the things to think differently, and what are the ways to challenge their way that they do think. So I think we probably share the most with the schematic metacognitive therapy. And, and the feedback that I've gotten, and I could say we've gotten doing trainings um, where people come here or we go there, where they've received trainings in other types mm -hmm. of the cognitive therapies is um, what they find most helpful about REBT is the elegant solution. Uh, you yes. know, that we bring people to their worst case scenario and we teach them uh, how to cope with it. Um, whereas other types of therapies will, will tend to avoid that. And yes. you know, and say at the level as, as Dr. Giuseppe was saying about you know the the negative automatic thoughts or the inferences, and there's nothing wrong with that. But but in our opinion, it helps people to be if they can cope with their worst case scenario, then it, they could generalize to a range of various negative activating events. And people say that you know that while it's very uncomfortable to be confronted with that, it is the most helpful for them. Yes, actually. I like this, the worst scenario and also the fact that you pay a lot of attention to goals. Yes. Yeah. That's the two ideas I like more. Do you agree that the worst scenario may be a better version of acceptance because yes. you, yes, you accept yes. but really yes. feel right. the pain? I think <laughs> acceptance has become a much more common yeah term in psychotherapy yeah. today, and I think that there's two distinctions. Sometimes people think of acceptance as accepting my thoughts and feelings, mm -hmm. and which we would say, yes, you need to do that, and sometimes people mean accepting the bad things in reality. So we would say you work on accepting the bad things in reality plus the bad thoughts and feelings that you might have. And, and I would say that, 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 that people... Um, have some resistance to the term acceptance because they they think acceptance equates to liking it or condoning it or saying it's okay and that's not the case at all we're not saying it's you know you should like when bad things happen you know when life circumstances happen accepting it is acknowledging it, it is not you know it's not saying it shouldn't happen it's saying it is happening and how am I going to cope I think if we could rewrite history we would say that maybe a better English word could have been acknowledging reality rather than accepting reality because accepting sometimes has a meaning of approve or embracing. We want people just to admit or acknowledge the reality. Uh, yes. 
you acknowledge, but you don't. Uh, appro you. You don't have to approve. Yeah. You don't have to like it, and you probably won't like it. But <coughs> it's happening, and, and you know, how are you going to cope? And this is really. Uh, in the, and a possible criticism is the lower attention to the past, uh, uh, etc. For example, uh, it seems to me that the schema therapy of uh, Young is an attempt to uh, integrate mm -hmm. this past in the... What do you think about uh, this operation and do you really think that there is no room for the past in uh, our, our EBT approach? There's definitely room for the past. I think that that is a misconception of mm -hmm. RIBT that we completely ignore the past. That's not the case at all. The past has an influence on us. I think the difference is that we look at how the past is affecting us in the present. Mm -hmm. So we, we will spend time discussing, you know, past events, but we won't, that's not the majority of the therapy because we don't think it's as productive. But so really the question is, how is what happened to you then affecting you now? See, another way that I think we can look at this is whether something is helpful versus necessary for change. So I think it, for many clients, it's helpful to say, I have this belief now, and I can see how I learned it when I was younger, and the context that I learned it makes it less true in my life now. So that'll help me give it up. But I don't think you need to do that. And some people have difficulty remembering their past. Mm -hmm. So we would say that that kind of analysis of the past is helpful, not necessary. Yes. Yeah. And uh, another question. Do you think that uh, this metacognition may be a sort of fashionable, non version of the <laughs> secondary problem? <laughs> Very. <laughs> so you think metacognition is kind of a fashionable Yeah, it is an, yes, it's another... Of the secondary problem, right. that's... What do you think about your feeling? <laughs> I think that the metacognition, the problem about the problem, has always been a very important part of human suffering. Because when you think about how awful it is that you have a bad emotion, you don't think about changing that mm -hmm. first primary situation. So. This idea of the meta-emotional problem has been with REBT since I was a fellow here in 1975. Al taught us to pay attention to that. I think the rest of the world is kind of catching up yeah. to what Al taught us to do. Okay, do you want to add something? Um, no, I, you know, this is, a, this is a very exciting time of year for us at the Institute because we have the opportunity for people from all over the world to come here and learn what we do, but also we learn from the participants, you know, that the, the, the minor differences or sometimes the major differences in cultural aspects. So it's, it's been a pleasure getting to know all of, all of you guys from Italy and around the world. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.